All right. Let's get started. Can you hear me okay? Great. All right. Welcome out, everybody. Thanks for coming. Today, I'm going to be talking about what's new in iOS. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Ryan Plitt. I'm an iOS developer. I've been working at STG for about two years, a little over two years. And uh, this year, I had the honor of going to WWDC, which, for those of you that don't know, is Apple's Worldwide Developer Conference in San Jose. Now, this is going to be a little weird because I normally walk a lot. I pace a lot. So hopefully everybody online can hear me okay. And that's why I have my AirPod in. I'm not just on a phone call. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit about me. Uh, it, was, it was a little difficult preparing this presentation because I didn't know quite who my audience would be. So I tried to make this as broad as possible. For those of you that just might be interested in iOS, for those of you who have specific roles relating around technology and so forth. So if you have any questions at any time, feel free to interrupt me. I want to talk about, oh, you can see my, that's unfortunate. Let's get rid of that. I don't know if I can actually get rid of that. Sorry about that. All right, so I wanted to talk a little bit about iPhone to begin with. I was one of the few people in 2007 who was very excited to buy their first iPhone. So this was my iPhone. <laughs> of course, not this actual one, but um, I just remember it, thinking that this is going to change the world. And uh, I didn't even realize that here I am seven years later starting my career into iOS development. But I knew that I liked Apple. I had a Mac. I, I worked on Macs growing up. I was excited about the idea of an iPhone. And I got the first one. Well, as you can imagine, since then, there have been quite a few changes, specifically around the operating system. And as this goes on, you'll notice app icons have changed, designs have changed, screen sizes have changed. And eventually, we'll get to iOS 12, which is what you guys know today. Now, out of curiosity, how many people here use an iPhone as a primary device? OK, about half. Perfect demographic. What? What do you mean by primary device? The one right in front of you. The one you use the most. <laughs> okay. All right. <clears throat> so I just wanted to make mention that there's been a lot of exciting things that have happened specifically related to the iOS, to, to the operating system itself over the last several years. And this year is definitely no different. So at WWDC, they talked about iOS 13. Today, this is my agenda. We're going to talk about some not important thing, not important stuff, but still very exciting to me and to most iPhone users. We're going to talk about some important things and how it applies to everybody in this room, hopefully. Hopefully, I can cover everybody. And last, we're going to do a code demo. Now, I was told not to do a live code demo, and I tried so many times to record a not live code demo, and I failed <laughs> every time. So we're going to try a live code demo and see how it goes. So try and be nice to me, OK? All right. And last, we'll have questions. So I should leave a couple minutes at the end for any questions you guys have. iOS 13, let's talk about it. What is it all about? Well, there's a lot of new features, most of which you'll probably recognize on the next upcoming screens. Dark mode. Dark mode is the new big thing. Uh, it's absolutely gorgeous. It has different themes for light and dark. It has dynamic wallpapers. And of course, it works with all your favorite apps. And we're going to talk more about dark mode in a second. Files. Files has been totally updated and improved so that you can use external drive support. You can also share iCloud folders. Calendar. You can now add attachments to calendar items, which is super useful, something I've wished has been there for a long time. There's been a lot of improvements with the Health app. The Health app has now been updated to include cycle tracking for women, so you can do period prediction and windows, as well as fertile windows and predictions. There's also all sorts of interactive charts and a whole bunch of new stuff around help. They did a really good job this year. A lot of it looks really good, really cool. Sign in with Apple is another thing that we're going to talk about. This is Apple's new single-click authentication. 
This is very similar to how sign in with Facebook or sign in with Google works, except with Apple. There's a lot of privacy and security built in that, again, we'll talk about in a moment. Accessibility is another thing we'll talk about. There's a lot of cool new features around accessibility. This is something that uh, not all of our users use, but if we implemented them into our apps, we could have all of our users use them, right? We could have more, a broader audience. So uh, some things include better navigation and voice control. Music has been improved to do in-time synced lyrics. So if you want to do karaoke, now you can with iOS 13. The share sheet is now smarter and has one tap shares. The keyboard has been improved to have quick path is what they call it, which is basically the swipe. So now with iOS 13 built in, you can use swipe on your keyboard. Safari has been updated with the download manager. It also gives you warnings when you enter in any weak passwords. Settings has been improved so that you can specify that you want low data mode. So for those of you that run through your assigned data every month, you can turn on low data mode and it will be smarter about when it syncs across that data. It's very similar to how low battery mode works. Maps has been built from the ground up. I didn't feel like showing you a demo of maps would be appropriate in this setting, but if you get a chance, look at the new maps. It looks amazing. Um, it's definitely giving Google Maps a run for its money this year. And I'm, I'm a big Google Maps supporter. Memoji and Messages has been improved. You can now share your name and phone number and contact information, like your profile picture, with people that you text. It's all automatic now. So you can set a profile picture of yourself, text a stranger, and then it will ask, do you want to share your contact information with this person? And you say yes. It's a great way to share new contact information across messages. Also, there are three new Memojis, if you're a big Memoji user. A mouse, an octopus, and a cow. Camera's been improved. <clears throat> Excuse me. Camera's been improved, of course. Most of these camera improvements are revolve around portrait mode and portrait lighting. Notes now has a gallery view. Performance improvements have been made. Your apps now launch two times faster, and Face ID is 30% faster. I honestly did not believe those numbers until I downloaded the beta. It's true. It's much faster. HomeKit has been improved to include HomeKit secure video. This is HomeKit's way of taking uh, information related to cameras inside your home, encrypting them, sending them through iCloud. Through two-way encryption, you're able to view those cameras. It's very secure and all related to your Apple sign-in. Text editing has been improved so that you can grab the scroll bar. Cursor navigations have been improved so that it jumps, your cursor jumps around with words instead of through words, making it a little easier to select things. There's been privacy and security updates, mostly revolving around location. There's now support for motion capture and people occlusion and augmented reality. You can, it now, iOS now supports PS4 and Xbox One controllers. I don't know why you would want to play a game on your iPhone with a PS4 controller, but now you can. It also works with Apple TV, which makes a lot more sense. The system experience has been improved, especially Control Center. Control Center allows you to do more things like select which Wi-Fi you want to choose or select your Bluetooth. There's an all-new Photos tab in Photos, along with a yearly tab that allows you to go back in years. It's really pretty. Books now has reading goals, which is awesome. I always want to read my iBooks and then I always forget a week later. But with reading goals, you can set a goal for yourself and achieve those reading goals. HomePod has been improved so that you can do personalized uh, uh, experience. So it's mo uh, multiple users are able to use the same HomePod now, which is something that HomePod has never had. Find My is a new app. I know I'm going through this fast, sorry. Find My is a new app that um, combines two previous apps, Find My Friends and Find My iPhone. Now it's one app. And it's fantastic. It, it uh, uses a lot of great new features like offline devices can now be found using Find My. Reminders has been improved completely. There's a whole new UI around it. There's more options that you can choose from. There's more support than ever for more languages, 38 new languages. Screen time has been improved so that you can combine app limits 
And there's a feature called One More Minute, which will allow people with screen time restrictions to save in that last minute. AirPods now have audio sharing, which is really cool. I'm still going. I got a few more left. <laughs> uh, audio sharing is really cool. You can now connect two AirPods to one iOS device. Share it. Phone has been improved. This is my favorite feature. You can silence unknown callers. So if the caller does not exist in your contacts, it goes right to voicemail. Love that feature. It's actually the reason I installed the beta. <laughs> it's worth it. Shortcuts is now an app. Uh, yes, for now. It's September. September is when iOS is released in public. The public beta is available now if you're interested in downloading the public beta. Shortcuts is now a new built-in app that handles automation. And of course, mail has been improved. You can now mute specific threads, block specific senders, and there's multicolor flags. <sighs> All right. That's iOS 13. A lot of new features packed into this new operating system and so much to talk about through so many sessions of WWDC. But today, we're going to talk about three of them. Can you see which ones are highlighted? Maybe not very well. Today, we're going to talk about accessibility, dark mode, and sign in with Apple. These are three features that are kind of related to more of the development world um, than many of the others and apply to more of a broad application use. For example, we're not going to talk about AR. AR is very cool, but that's for a topic for another day. Let's start with accessibility. I mentioned this before. Sorry, I need to slow down. There's a lot of iOS 13s to get through. All right, I mentioned this before, but accessibility is really awesome. This is something that not a lot of users think about, or because not a lot of users need these accessibility options. And in turn, not a lot of developers think about accessibility controls and how they might affect people who have problems hearing or seeing or have problems with motion control. But there's been a lot of new improvements, especially over the last two years, and Apple has put a real big focus on accessibility with some of their new APIs. Two I want to talk about specifically, voice control, and FS symbols. Now, voice control is Apple's new way of being able to command your iOS or Mac device using just your voice. It's actually very, very powerful. In fact, let's just watch a short video on it. Wake up. Voice control is a breakthrough feature that gives you full control of your device with just your voice, period. It's a whole new way to do everything you love, period. Like this. Correct love. 16. Scroll up. Set number. 13. Click share. 3. Ten. Next field. Let's write this one today. No, that's good. Click next. Open map. Show grid. Small press. Point. Open app switcher. Four. Tap share. Tap camera. Tap red. Turn up the volume. Right. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. So again, accessibility is something that we don't really think about, but it changes the lives of other people. Now, the question you're probably asking yourself is, what does that mean for me as a person who probably doesn't use accessibility settings? Well, it depends on your role. If you're a developer like myself, these are things that we need to think about. And Apple is making accessibility APIs easier than ever to use. If you're an account manager or somebody who's <clears throat> talking to other clients who might have specific needs, these are things to keep in mind. Um, 
if you're recruiting, these are kind of the one-off things that you can ask potential candidates about and say, tell me about accessibility to see how well they have used these settings in the past. And like I said, with iOS 13, it's way easier than ever. Wake up. And we're not going to watch it again. All right. So next on my list is SF symbols. SF, uh, the SF there stands for San Francisco. San Francisco is the default font used in Apple in a, on iOS. So if you open up your settings page, all the font is San Francisco. That's what it's called. Came out several years ago. This year, Apple has introduced SF symbols. And what that is, for those of you who are familiar with maybe Sketch, symbols are reusable icons that can be used all over your app. SF symbols is no different, although it has some awesome, awesome things to it. Excuse me. Here we just see the normal music app. You can see that there's no additional um, dynamic type. But for certain people, people like their text really small. So this is a little bit smaller. Some people like their text really big. I think we all know a person who has their text really big. I don't know. I do. I know several. <laughs> and these are the things that we need to account for as developers because now all the cells are much larger. All the icons now need to be bigger. Everything on the screen is bigger. SF Symbols makes this so much easier. What Apple has essentially done is they have taken hundreds of common symbols and have incorporated them into a way that has nine different font sizes, font uh, weights. So along with San Francisco, San Francisco includes font weights from ultra thin to I think it's called extra, extra large or bold or something. But now, these symbols are made available for every single font weight. But more importantly, they're made available for every size. So each symbol now includes a small, a medium, and a large size. Now that's a lot of symbols, but it accounts for some gorgeous UI. This is the mail app, and you can see that now all the icons scale perfectly with the text. Nothing is out of proportion, except it's really big. <laughs> All right, so what does this look like? This is what it looks like. This is a screen recording that I made of all the different symbols that are available. And I just did it really quickly, so it's not the best. But you'll get an idea of what symbols are included in this project. There's hundreds of them, you know, mostly revolving around circles or squares or common icons like arrows. Sometimes you'll see, you'll see common arrows like uh, related to weather or contact information, liking or disliking, phone calls, media controls, and all sorts of symbols. Now remember, every single one of those symbols is available on, on all nine weights and all three sizes, making your app totally versatile to accommodate any size. And yes, SF Symbols supports custom icons as well. So this is uh, an application that is still in beta. It's called SF Symbols by Apple. And you can create your own custom symbols. So this is one that's not in the library, but an example of what one might look like if you were to customize your own. Now, some people are looking at this and probably thinking, wow, that's a lot of work. Is that worth it? Yes. The answer is yes. Um, this makes a insane amount of difference for those who have those accessibility settings turned on. Not only are they easier to read, but they flow with the UI so much better. And this is the future of what symbols are going to look like. Icons in iOS has always been a little weird, but SF symbols is definitely the future. And if you are a developer who works closely with a designer, make sure that your designer is familiar with this product, okay? I, I understand that this kind of puts a lot of weight on the designer, but this is absolutely the future of iOS. Again, what does this mean? If you're a developer, be sure to know how to implement those SF symbols. There's not a lot of work, honestly, on the developer's end. It's a simple, a couple lines of code. If you're a recruiter looking for a designer, make sure that they're up to date on the latest technologies. 
this is going to be different for iOS and Android now, making their mobile de designer skills have to be broader. But it's going to be worth it in the end. All right. Those are the, oh, there we go. Dark mode's next. Dark mode is absolutely gorgeous. I'm already running out of time. Jeez, time flies when you're having fun. Dark mode is absolutely gorgeous. This TV does not do it justice, to be honest. <laughs> but it looks great. Um, there's customizable wallpapers that can go light to dark. Notifications look different. Everything is just beautiful. Now, going from light mode to dark mode might seem like an easy thing. You just invert the colors. But it's really not that simple. Any designer or developer who has tried to make a dark theme knows what I'm talking about. You can see from this, this uh, image, people online aren't going to get a very good feel, but the background, the gray background up at the very top behind settings is a gray, where this is a true dark black. Okay? So you'll notice that the white doesn't go to the dark black, the gray goes to the dark black, and so forth. So there's a lot of subtleties to this theming that is really difficult to explain. But this visual will give you a little bit of an idea of what I'm talking about. We now have, with iOS 13, system background colors. And these are the system background colors, depending upon what theme they're on. But again, you can see the difference. The white is the black, and then it goes darker, where this goes lighter. And then it goes back to white, where this goes even darker. It's just weird subtleties, but yet it looks so great. I'm rushing through this. Sorry. So how does this work? In Xcode, you're going to see dynamic colors. Every color that you import into your assets folder now has a light mode and a dark mode. So it's really easy to change your custom color from one to the other when the user switches from one theme to the other. And of course, everything works in real time. This is how it's done. There's a new appearance dropdown over on the right where you can select your, your uh, theme for any and dark. Again, what does this mean? Well, for users, it means that you have a beautiful new interface coming. For developers like myself, it means we have to become familiar with how to use different colors. And again, sorry designers, we need specific designs for both themes now. Users are absolutely going to expect this. Everybody is excited about dark mode. Honestly, I didn't think I would like it. I tried it, and I love it. And I'm sure a lot of the other users will as well. All right. Last thing on my list, and then I have two more. <sighs> Sign in with Apple. Sign in with Apple is Apple's new way of, of single authentication. It's just a simple button. It looks just like the Facebook and Google ones, except prettier, because there's an Apple. No fighting. <laughs> Um, so what does this look like? It's, it's, it's easy, secure, and it verifies that you're an actual user. And it looks great inside of an app. This is an app that they demonstrated that uses sign in with Apple Bird. For those of you that aren't familiar with it, it's the scooter rental, one of the e-scooter rental apps. But all it takes is one click. One click and you're presented with this menu. This menu is going to say, these are all the things that this application is requesting of you, personal information, like name, email address, and so forth. Now, the greatest feature of this is that you'll notice under email, there's a hide my email option. Hide my email is fantastic because what it actually does is it generates a random ID email, assigns it to you for this specific application, and then forwards any email that you'll get from this app to your real email address via iCloud. So you don't have to share your personal information, or you can. But again, if you click the hide my email, it will just send it to that randomly assigned address, forward it to your address, and then delete it at the source. Apple doesn't keep any emails, nor would I think they want to. All right. So again, what does this mean? This means that we have to learn how to incorporate this in our app. Furthermore, Apple is requiring this on any application that already uses third-party sign-ins, such as Facebook or Google. So if you use an application 
that says sign in with Facebook or sign in with Google, I think it's sometime summer next year, you'll be required to see this option. So developers need to put this in. This has to be a priority. All right. I'm going kind of fast because I'm running out of time. I want to have room for questions. There's two more things that we haven't talked about. And these uh, two things are not related to the iOS specific, but how it's developed. The first one is Xcode, and the second one is SwiftUI. Start with Xcode. The new Xcode 11 looks great. It offers a mini map. There's drag and drop complete uh, improvements. The inline diff is amazing, and everything works real time and is really great and really smooth. I'll show you a demo of Xcode 11 in just a moment. The biggest announcement that was made at WWDC for developers is Swift UI. It, for those of you that are not familiar with Swift UI, this is a complete new framework that is going to replace UI Kit. All the things that we thought we knew about putting views on an iPhone screen were just demolished in one moment. And I'll show you an example of why in just a moment. But Swift UI is fully native. Before, we were using Objective-C um, backbones to really support our Swift. Now, Swift is the primary language, and Swift UI is fully native. Next, it uses a declarative syntax. It's really, really easy to read, and it's fantastic, fantastically simple. And, it's, and code is simpler and easier to read. <laughs> so what is this like? So before, they used this analogy, and I thought it was kind of fun. Before, using UI kit, our syntax was imperative, which is kind of like calling your friend on the phone and describing to them how to make avocado toast. Of course, I was at WWDC in Southern California, Northern, Mid-California, and uh, so of course they're talking about avocado toast. <clears throat> but if you were to call your friend and describe all the steps, it would start out simple, Here's a list of things that you need. Here, gather all, the, gather all the equipment, toast a slice of bread, and so on and so forth. But even just a simple task can get pretty lengthy. And 14 steps for avocado toast is kind of ridiculous. But that's what it was like using UIKit in previous. But with iOS 13 and Swift UI, it becomes a declarative syntax, which is kind of like talking to an avocado chef and saying, make me avocado toast. All you have to say is, I'd like some avocado toast, uncharred sourdough with almond butter, sea salt, and red pepper flakes. Oh, and cut it diagonally. Thank you. This is what the new syntax looks like using Swift UI, and it is fantastic. Now, I know that I haven't showed you an example of what Swift UI looks like yet, and I will. But what does this mean? This means that it's changing the way that we write code. Code is now faster to write. It's easier to write. It's less error prone. And it's more dynamic. It Swift, anything that you write in Swift UI fully features things like the accessibility that we talked about in dark mode. So there's no need for extra code. And it's, and it's fast. And it's really clean. All right. Let's do a quick demo. Quick demo. Maybe. There we go. All right. So I'm going to open up Xcode. And I'm going to make a new project. And I'm just going to call this project names with a Z, apparently. Kind of nervous, sorry. All right, now, for those of you who are familiar with Xcode, probably not a lot of you, this looks very different than Xcode 10. The thing that's loading on the right-hand screen right now is brand new in Xcode 11, and it's fully featured. It's called the Canvas. And you'll notice that it's immediately building and running my app. What this does is this just provides a live preview of what my UI might look like. What was that? Zoom in. Oh, make the. Mm. 
Sorry, I can't make this bigger. All right. So we have a live preview of what our view actually looks like. And all that's displaying right now is this, these lines of code. But what's awesome is that this canvas over here on the right actually updates in real time. So if I were to type my name, I know it's hard to see that small, small thing, but you can see that the cell automatically updates to reflect what my code says. And it also works the other way. So you can open up an inspector. What is this? I don't know what that is. Sorry about that. You can open up an inspector and actually change it. And as you might expect, it changes the code over on the left. This makes it really easy and really fast to make user interfaces. There's a whole library of objects that you can just simply drag out and drop. And you'll see that Xcode is literally writing the code for you to back this view. And you can make any sort of adjustments that you want inside the inspector, like, like alignment, or maybe, come on, state of software, bear with me. All right, like alignment. <laughs> and the code writes itself. Fantastic. It's really good for educational purposes, too. If you know how to do something on the screen, or if you know what you, your, your UI, what you want it to look like, you can drag out objects, and the code will build itself so that you can understand what the code is doing. OK, I'm going to change this back to Ryan. And I'm just going to build a very simple app that displays a list of names. And then if you click on one of those names, there we go. If you click on one of those names, it will bring you to a detail view. Now, sometimes the canvas gets a little bogged down, and I have to click the Resume button. But you'll see that now it's being reflected appropriately. <sighs> OK. All right. To do this, I'm going to build a model object first. So I'm just going to build a simple Swift, uh, Swift file. I'm going to call this Names. And I'm going to import my names that I have made earlier. So all this is is a simple model object called Name that has a name and a gender. And then, just for fun, I decided to look up 2019's most popular baby names and took the top 10 of each gender. So I have a list of names. Okay. If I go back to my content view, you can see that I need to build out what my cell of this table view is going to look like. So to do that, I'm going to make an op image. Remember, the SF symbols that I talked about before is now built into this application. So I can use any number one of those hundreds of symbols, as long as I know the name. I'm going to use this person symbol. And I need it to be in a horizontal stack. All right, and now if I click the resume button, you'll see that I have my icon. Come on. You'll see that I have my icon. There you go. Over on the left of my, of my name. And this is what I want my cell to look like. So to turn it into a table view, all you have to do is embed this stacked view inside of a list. And this is why I should have done a video. You'll see immediately that my view on the right now turns into a table view with my one object in it. If I wanted to, I could command click and repeat this a number of times, and it will update in real time, almost real time. All right, and now I have five Ryans. What a perfect world. That's three more than there are in this room, right? All right, so let's get rid of this for each and start me stop messing around here a little bit. I did not. No. What I actually did was I command clicked on this H stack and it infers the item for me. So that is the item that is being repeated. All right. Cool thing about this list view is that it can take in an array of model objects, a list of model objects. 
So if I modify the code to look a little different, sorry, I know that this is very large, hard to read probably. So if I modify the list to take in a list of sorted names, those names being the objects that I made earlier, I have to specify how I identify them because they have to be unique. So I'll say I identify them by the actual person's name. Now I can go in here and say display the person's name. And if I click resume, you'll see just like that I've generated a list of all these names. Before in UIKit, you'll just have to take my word on it. This is a lot of code. We're looking up to probably, I don't know, a couple hundred lines of code just to make this list. And I've made this list using, what, five? Never had that happen before. It's awesome. And we can do anything that we want. We can change the uh, color. We can change the colors to red. That changes just the property of the text. This is called a modifier function. So if you, do, you can add a modifier on the back of a view and it will modify that view and return that view. So you can make adjustments after the fact. It's really handy. So for example, if I wanted to change the foreground color of my entire stack to be either blue or pink, based off of the gender, it's just one simple line of code. And now I've modified that entire cell to look a little better. All right. I'm going to take this cell. And one great thing about Swift UI is that it's encouraged to take your, your views and make them as small as possible. So I'm going to extract this subview. There's an option for that called extract subview. And I'm going to call this name cell. I know I'm going fast, but I want to make sure that I can show you the majority of the features here. And now, just like that, I've extracted this cell. The cell is re relying on an actual name object. So I'll give it a name object so that it can calculate the gender. And then when I initialize my name cell, I'll pass the name that I'm getting from my list. And just like that, I've extracted this view so that this, this top view is way easier to read. And everything works the exact same. All right. One more thing. Let's put this inside. Yes. Yes. So that is that is new this year. So if you have experience with UIKit or Objective C, everything is a class, uh, especially the views. But now views are very lightweight. They can be struct objects, and they conform to this protocol, view protocol, which dictates that there will be a body property, which is what we're editing. So last thing I wanted to add, maybe, zoom, oh, or zoom, work, work, live demo, work. All right, is a title. So just like that, with one line of code, I included it inside of a navigation view. Now it knows that this view is part of a navigation item. And it automatically gives us this large, bold title up at the top of the screen, which is what we want. Stay with me. I'm almost done. Five minutes. All right. One more thing that I wanted to do is build a detail view. So if I build a detail view using SwiftUI, it's going to look very similar to the content view before. And instead of saying, hello world, I'm going to say, hello, whatever name I click on. Just like before, I need a name property to work with on my detail view. And for my, for my preview, which is what this struct is down below, I'm going to just include my information. My name is Ryan. I'm a male. And there you go. So this is our detail view. I'm just going to make it a little different. I'm going to do, actually, I'm just going to leave it like that for now. OK, this is great. Now, one last thing I want to do is click on one of these cells and have it take me to that detail view. But I'm looking at this cell, and I'm like, ah, it could use a little padding. All that we have to do for that is 
inside of our cell, go to the image, say dot padding. That gives us a little bit more padding to work with around our image. Looks a little nicer, I think. I'll take it. All right, and for our cells, we're going to say uh, navigation button. Sorry, with uh, this big of code, these lines don't start to match up very well. But you'll notice that I just wrapped our name cell inside of a navigation button. Our navigation button has a destination, which is called detail view. Our detail view takes in that name object. And what it does for us in the UI is it immediately shows these chevrons, indicating that we can now select the cell and push it over. Now, this preview over here on the left is really great to view one screen. And I know it's kind of hard to see, but there's a play button down at the bottom. What this play button actually does is it generates all my code for me and puts it in a usable state so that I can interact with this view. Maybe. There we go. All right. So you can see now I can just swipe on this. Our, our title goes from a large title to a small title, just like we expected. And you can click on one of these cells, and it brings us to our detail view with the updated name. We pass that information from one view to the other successfully. Now, I know that this was a very rough and extremely fast demo, but the point was I wanted to show you. Oh, boy, that's not what I meant to click at all. <laughs> I wanted to show you how easy it was to use SwiftUI to build a beautiful app. Oh, one last thing, one last thing, one last thing. This is important. All right. The preview thing is really cool. So here's our preview. What's really cool about previews is you can group previews together to show um, multiple previews. So for example, I showed you the accessibility options before. OK, well, that's fun. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Don't do live demos, people. There we go. All right, so I showed you some of these accessibility settings before. But using the previews, you can actually preview what your app is going to look like for those different environments. So for example, over on the right, we have the generic what it's going to look like for everybody. But if I reload this somehow, maybe. Oh, it's because I'm playing. Ha, silly me. Click the stop button here so that we're not running our preview anymore. You can scroll down, and you can show multiple previews. So this is a preview with our extra, extra large font selected. You can see that the fonts are much, much larger. It's kind of hard to tell it's going up and down. But you can see the fonts are much, much larger, as well as the symbols have been adjusted to be the appropriate size. That's because we use the SS symbols that I mentioned before. And you can even use this to preview dark mode. And the white at the top is a bug with the latest beta. Again, beta software. But other than the white at the top, it looks great for our app. Dark mode is fully featured. And if you click on one of these, oh, if you click play and then click on one of them, You'll see that it brings us to a detail view. Remember, our text in our detail view was black before, but SwiftUI is smart enough to know that because it's inverted, because we're in dark mode, we want the white text. So really fast demo on how, how easy it is to build a SwiftUI app. Before, this would have taken hundreds of lines of code to support all the accessibility features that SwiftUI supports. That took me 15 minutes to make a demo project in front of you of a master detail application which, again, is not trivial in UIKit. Um, that's all I had today. Um, hope you enjoyed the demo. Sorry I went a little long. I do want to answer any questions that you have, so feel free to ask any questions. Uh -huh.
we do not separate the institution itself because right now you have already created and did something you know name. Sure. Sure. So this, uh, it just reminds me when I use the you know uh, objective C in the you know we use the COCA. The COCA was the UI stuff which is was very difficult. This one is really easy. Yes. Very, you know, then for the library you can tell me you you know how do I can access to this or just explain it to you what to do, you know. Does it I mean, Yes, yes, it's fully documented and the Swift UI is kind of a confusing name. It's the framework that is related to the UI experience with Swift, and kind of a dumb name, but uh, a very, very cool, very, very cool framework that is being used. So this is in, in uh, instead of UI kit that was used previous. And so if you've done Objective-C, if you've done iOS and Objective-C, you've used UI kit before. Um, and I get that that can be kind of confusing, but to present information on the screen, previous UI kit, now Swift UI, just ways of writing the same code, essentially. An interesting point is, I've seen some of the examples start to check the stack. Yeah. Yeah. So it is, it is very uh, reactive by nature. One thing that I didn't mention earlier is that you can actually link this list to our name array so that if this name array were to change either from a different view or from some database or back-end service that our UI would update automatically. So it's very reactive. They did not use the word reactive at WWDC. I think they were trying to stay away from that word. But it is it's very, very similar. Any other questions? I do have a question, but it almost certainly has nothing to do with no benefit for anybody else here, I think. So Absolutely. Happy to answer any questions afterwards. All right. Well. That's it. That's all I have.